I can uh, close my eyes like many of you can and return to the, the home of your, your youth. And you can think about all the different rooms and the furniture, the special knickknacks that maybe your loved ones had and put in a special place to collect that special dust. I can remember my parents' bedroom and how it was furnished. Very simply, I think there was probably uh, two pieces of furniture in the bed. There was a, a dresser. It was a light gray dresser, very shiny, contemporary for the 50s. And it was there and still sits in my mother's room now, today, uh, nearly 60 years later. As a child, I would approach that dresser, and I could see that there were some things on top of it. There was a, a little chest, um, actually a cedar chest. It came with the large cedar chest that my mother received at, at her wedding. And in that little chest, she kept all kinds of important documents and, and memorandums and things. And uh, I could see that as a child, but I really couldn't see anything else. And, and finally, when I, I grew to be four feet or so, I, I could see what was on top of that, that dresser. I always knew that there was a, a plate of glass sitting on the dresser, but I couldn't see what was on top of the glass or if there was anything underneath it. So when I got to be that height where I could see on top, I noticed that my mom had put a lot of photographs under there, photographs of her mother back in West Virginia, her siblings, and just things that were really important to her. And what really stands out to me is that on the left-hand side, left-hand corner, also on the edge, the front edge, there were two photographs that she had also slid under that glass that really stood out and were different. They were not family members. One photograph was this very traditional rendition of, of Jesus. It was his face, his long hair, um, it was a rendition that I think every church in the, in the time had hanging somewhere. And, and so publishers would reproduce this calling card size picture so that people could take Jesus home with them. So my mom had that, that picture there. And then next to that picture, she had um, the picture of Reverend Ralph Crandall, who was serving at the time the East Long Meadow Methodist Church, located right in the center of town. Reverend Crandall probably came in the early to mid-50s and stayed until a little bit after, maybe 1960, 61. But his picture was there, and, and Jesus and his, 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 his garb and his robe, and, and there's Reverend Crandall, he's, he's got his black robe on and white shirt, looking really distinguished uh, and looking very pastoral. And his picture was there, and I always wondered, you know, why, why, why is... How many of you have your, my picture on your dresser? Raise your hand. I know, I know, I know. Yes, <laughs> yes thank you, Les. But, but I always wonder, why is Reverend Crandall's picture there, and why did it stay there even years after Reverend Crandall moved on? I have never asked my mother that question yet. But I'll tell you something that I did learn about Reverend Crandall. Reverend Crandall had a ministry of outreach, and it was a very important ministry. It was probably being done by a lot of pastors at the time, because in East Long Meadow, like East, East, East Hartford, there were a lot of young families moving in in the mid-50s. And so Reverend Crandall would check the town hall to see who was moving in. He would pay attention to the newspaper to see who was buying homes. And then he would go and make contact with every family member that he could find. Just to say hello, hi, I'm Reverend Ralph Crandall, I'm at the Methodist Church. If you don't have a faith family or faith community, feel welcome to come to the East Long Meadow Methodist Church. Um, whatever we can do for you, we have a Sunday school, so on and so forth. And then I imagine that he would leave a calling card behind. Something that would make a little connection as well as a reminder to the family, to the individual, that, that they could call upon him. Well, Reverend Crandall did that at my house. We had moved in somewhere around 1956, 57, and Reverend Crandall found his way and found my mother. And he reached out to her. 
invited her to come with me, I was the only child at the time, to be part of this faith community called the East Lawn Meadow Methodist Church. Sixty years later, my mother's still a member of that church. Sixty still years later, she still sings in the choir. Reverend Crandall left something with her so strong that she was attracted to not only the community in him, but the life that was pouring out of that church. I think Jesus did things like that a lot, and that's where we get the example. I can imagine Jesus walking from village to village, barefoot or with sandals, reaching out to individuals and families who, who needed to hear a message. He didn't have a church to invite them to. He was inviting them into a new life. He was inviting them to take part and to share in the message that he had for them. It was a message that really wasn't from Jesus, but it was a message from God. About God. Jesus had a calling card. And his calling card was not a little piece of paper, of course. His calling card was a visible and spoken truth that came to him from God. And it was a spoken truth about a love and a mercy that had no limits and no boundaries. You see, Jesus would go from place to place, from person to person, from heart to heart, leaving a message and an example that no one would forget. And he did it from the beginning of his earthly ministry when he came down from that mountain after being tempted all the way, all the way to the cross. He was still ministering and leaving a message. There's two on his left and his right. The soldiers in the bottom that were taunting him. Jesus had a message, and it was a visible and true message about the revealing and the coming of the kingdom of God, a message that love and, and, and God's mercy and passion were cutting the way to a new creation. But not everyone accepted Jesus' message. Not everyone wanted to see his example. Not everyone wanted to believe that a God could could. could Forgive cheats. Forgive cheats. People that, that take money from people who have no money. They couldn't believe that. Or could they believe that there could be a God that would forgive prostitutes? Ugh. Or a God that, 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 that could forgive people who are unclean. And some of these people were very, very, very religious people. They were, they were committed to God. They had given their life. They, they studied the, the, the Torah. They were in the temple all day, all night. But, but when it came to this Jesus, this, this fellow, this rabbi, who hung around with the scum of the earth, they said, oh, this can't be our, can't be our God. It's got to be another God. You know what? I, I think what really troubled the Pharisees and the scribes is that they had to look over the shoulders of these prostitutes, of these cheats, of these, these unclean people to see Jesus. Because Jesus welcomed them right up close. The, you know, the rabbis would say, come and sit or come and stand. And the rabbi would sit under a tree and, and talk and preach and, and heal and do all these things. And of course, the, the the Pharisees, they, they wouldn't get too close because if they got too close, they would be in holy trouble. They, they'd have to go spend 30 days and get clean and they couldn't go in the temple. They couldn't perform their duties. They just wouldn't want to get close. And so they really didn't like looking over the shoulders of those who were so close to Jesus, all those sinners. And so the religious leaders let Jesus know about their dissatisfaction with his ministry. And so what Jesus did, he was so brilliant. He would turn his preaching to them. Because Jesus would not give up, even on his, his, his worst enemies, his opponents, his critics. He would not give up. And so he would fashion stories that he would remember from way back. And he would, he would take a 
with him a little bit so that he could get the message right to those opponents and those critics. And of course, you know, those sinners that were listening to these stories about themselves were just soaking it up because it was so loving and so merciful and so careful and so prayerful that they're going, Jesus is talking about us and he's talking to these religious, righteous leaders behind us. And he's using us as, as living examples of how God's love is, is boundless and without limits. And so Jesus told stories such as this morning's parable of the loving father and, and these stories became a way for Jesus to, to leave a message behind as he, he moved from place to place. It was a way to remember not necessarily Jesus but a way to remember what Jesus had to say about God. You see, Jesus is God's calling card. And in the words of the New Testament scholar, Joe Kim, Jeremiah, he says, and I quote, Jesus makes a claim for himself that he is acting in God's stead, that he is God's representative. And so Jesus' preaching is, yes, of course, that Jesus, the figure is there, but what Jesus' goal is, is come to know God through me. And what I leave behind with you is, is what God really wants you to understand and feel and know. And what is that message? This morning we hear it. It's a God message, as a, as a calling card that Jesus leaves behind. That is the story of, the, of this lost son and this loving father who has love for, for his returning sinner son. In a love that has no boundaries. And that's the message that Jesus was trying to get to the Pharisees. Well, they knew that they were to love God and to love their neighbor. And, but there were boundaries. There were restrictions. They, they couldn't be that full human with the full capacity to love. And, and Jesus was trying to break down those, those boundaries so that the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sabbaths, and whoever it was, could feel that what it really means to be fully human and to be able to love to, to the extent that God wants us to love. A love that reflects the love that God has for us. And ever since these gospel stories were written, they have been read and listened to with the same purpose. The purpose to leave behind a message. A message that, that you and I can take into the world. And it's not a complicated message. It's a simple message. It's a message that, that we can be transformed, we can be changed, we can, we can come forward and start new. We can, we can all do this because, because we have a God that loves us so much that, that creates this, this wide open space, this geography of love, this wide open opportunity to to start new. And so, in 2 Corinthians, as Frank shared with us this morning, so then from this point on, we don't recognize people by human standards. St. Paul says, even though we used to know Christ by human standards, that isn't how we know Him now. So that if anyone is in Christ, that person is part of a new creation. The old things, I love this one, the old things have, have, have gone away. And look, new things have arrived. That message, that calling card is so powerful. And that's what Jesus was trying to get to the Pharisees. You know, let go of this, this, this old stuff. And think about the new ways that God is moving in your life. Take, take notice. Well, I told you the story about my mother, how she became a Methodist. Just the way I became a Methodist. The story of my father is a little different. My father would, uh, we only had one car at the time, my mother didn't drive. So in the first years of uh, my life and my going to church with my mother, my dad would take us to church. I, I think this, is, this happened in other families too. And uh, 
Dad would drive us to church early. I spent a lot of time in church when I was young. Two services in Sunday school. Uh, my father would drop us off to church the front door. My mom and I would go in and start church. And Dad would drive down to his, his work buddy Clayton's house. Uh, Clayton's a great guy and had a nice little bar set up in the, in the basement of the, his house. Uh, Clayton smoked these cigars that would kill a moose. I, I don't understand. My dad would come back and I'd say, <laughs> But my dad would, would go there and they would talk work because they, they worked together in different construction sites. And, and then when the time came, he would uh, come and pick us up and go home. After Reverend Crandall left, Reverend Valentine came to uh, the Methodist Church and he noticed that now there was Gary and his brother Doug and, and my mom coming to church. And he knew that my dad was there and probably knew the story about my dad dropping us off and probably even saw my dad dropping us off. And so he reached out to him in the same fashion that, that Reverend Crandall did and he started talking to him about, you might want to consider being part of the faith life of your, of your two sons and your wife and we could really use your talents and so on and so forth. And I don't know what Reverend Valentine planted, or God planted in the heart of my father, but my father started going to church. Amen, Amen right? Amen. And, uh, and he became very faithful to the Methodist Church. He became a trustee. He became a chair of the building committee that built the new church in 1970. Still there today. And he, he really started to take serious uh, what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. And he left the mark behind. And I, of course, my mother was my chief instructor in the church. And my father also left the mark behind. And the importance of, of men being part of the life of the church and taking responsibility for their own discipleship and figuring out a way how to, to do that. And so I give credit to both of them for, for getting me to this place now. And so my parents would, would divorce when I was a young adult. And, and my mother needed that community. She needed to be feeling like, you know, things had, you know, she, she was of the age where divorce is terrible in any age, in any circumstances. But, but in her situation, in, in her age, and it was just, she really felt broken. She felt like, that, like, like that she was carrying this weight of sin upon her. And thanks be to God that the church was there for her. Her church, the doors were wide open. The people loved her. It, it, when she disappeared for a few weeks and was just so so sad and distressed and full of grief and sorrow, the, the church reached out to her and they brought her back into the life of the church and she started singing again and, and started feeling like she belonged. You can see where I'm going. It's the, the merciful father uh, loving her into that place. And the same thing with my father. Uh, he, he, he loved the church and, and now he couldn't go to the church that, that he used to belong to. He was such a, a strong leader in it. But he, had, he found another church and he, he found another place that he could serve in. And he could feel that, that love of God just welcoming him back in. Even though he had gone through this really sorrowful and painful, in some ways, shameful experience. He was welcomed back in to the love of the church. And, and he would move from place to place in western Massachusetts, finding a, a place where he wanted to be. But everywhere he went, he would feel the welcome, and he would go to church, and he would become part of that, that life. And for that, I am ever grateful as he has moved on to be among the saints, I pray. And so there is this son who left home with his, his inheritance. He left home with the share of his father's wealth, and he, he tried to, to live best according to his own choices. And, and when his choices failed, leaving him impoverished, he came to his senses. And I said, as I said as I read the gospel, this is a favorite part. He, he came to his senses. In other words, he came to this point to repent. And he acknowledged his sin. He acknowledged his sin against God. He acknowledged how he sinned and disgraced his father. And he saw that there was a new life. Now, when he looked at his new life, he, he saw that new life for him would be, I could probably be a mid-level worker. I could be a hired hand like those other folks that my father is hired. At least if I get the wages of a hired hand, I'm not going to starve. So 
he saw a new life, but, but it was within the, the, the confines of the sin that he had committed. Do you understand what I'm saying? You see, sin was still, still, still capturing his mind and his heart, so he could never imagine, he could never imagine being welcomed back into his family as a son. And so he comes to that place where he gets up and he goes to his father's home. And he approaches his father with all this, this new idea in his mind. And his father sees him. And he sees him with different eyes. And he rushes out to meet him. And before the son can fully confess his sin and ask for a job as a hired hand, the son is treated royally. A robe, a ring, sandals, the best of everything, a fattened calf, a party, everything is offered to him. And so this is the message that Jesus, this is the message that Jesus wants to leave. With his religious critics, with his opponents, with us, he wants to leave us with the message of the unimaginable love of God. He wants to leave us with the living example of this unimaginable love for the unwelcome, as well as the religious leaders who want to do away with him. Jesus is God's calling card to the world. And Jesus is a message left behind for all to see and experience. Jesus is the living message of God's love today through the power of the Holy Spirit. The living message means being the message. The living message is the message that, that leaves the mark of the gospel behind as we move forward. We, my brothers and sisters, are the living message. We are two calling cards. And calling cards, brothers and sisters, are only as good as the name and the message behind them. Leaving a calling card with no intention of answering the call or to stand by what is is listed on that card is like leaving a blank card. If you're going to leave a calling card that you're a follower of Jesus, you better make sure, you better make sure that your name stands by that calling. Because if somebody calls on you, you told me about your love of Jesus. You told me about your church life. You told me about how you pray for me. What does that mean? I called you five times and you never answered the phone. I left message and you never called me back. The calling card is only as good as the message. And Jesus has left us the best message possible. The message that we can share. And so discipleship is, is an answer to that, to that call of Christ to see with his eyes and be part of creating something new. <coughs> The good news is that a blank calling card also can be filled. It's not to be tossed away. A blank calling card has no message. But Jesus' name can go on there. The message can go on there. The message of his truth and his way and God's forgiving love. And so I say to you all this morning, don't be afraid to make cold calls. Don't be afraid to go out in the world and even complete strangers to drop a calling card. Letting them know about the love of Christ in your life. How you experienced it in your church or in the world. Don't be afraid about seeing and identifying someone who maybe feels like they're a little unwelcomed or underappreciated or misunderstood or rejected or set aside on the way. Don't be afraid to go over and drop a calling card. Letting them know about the death of God's love and the power of the Holy Spirit and how all things can be made new. The old can be left behind and the new can be found. So, church, what's new? I hope that you'll find something new as you go out into the world as those new creations. Amen. Amen.